3, verses 9 and 10, we read, Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty, and your vats will be bursting with wine. May the offering be received, please. Father God, we thank you for your abundant provision in our lives, for meeting all of our needs and richly, richly blessing us beyond our needs. We return this portion to you. Please use it for your glory and for the advancement of your kingdom. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now as we come to our time of prayer, are there any prayer requests? My sister-in-law, Vicki Kokenberg, has asked me to ask you to continue praying for Jerry. Jerry is having stem cell therapy. He has cancer. He's gone through m many treatments at this point. This is kind of like the last resort. So uh, he, they ask that you continue to pray for him. Any other prayer requests? We'll also be praying for Mark Mason as he recovers from his surgery. Okay, please pray with me. Father in heaven, we praise you and worship you for you are holy. You are our creator. You are almighty, all powerful, and all-knowing. You are just and merciful and gracious. You are loving and you are good. We thank you for your abundant blessings in our lives. Thank you for the salvation you offer us through your Son, Jesus. Thank you for not leaving us in our sin, but for rescuing us and making us more like you. Thank you for the beauty of your creation. Thank you for the relationships you've blessed us with, our families and our friends. 
We thank you for our church and the ways we've seen you working in us. Please help us to be faithful to you and to be a light for you in this community. We ask that you please lead our pastor search. We pray for the other churches in our community and around the world. May we all be faithful to you and your calling. We pray for the spread of the gospel throughout the world. We pray for our leaders. Please give them wisdom and integrity. May they govern in a manner that pleases you. May they uphold your justice and truth. Father, we ask you to keep our leaders from promoting evil. We repent of the evil that, that we uh, see and are guilty of, and we ask you to lead us away from it. Father, we have some specific requests for you this morning. We pray for Mark Mason, ask that you help him in his recovery, heal him, please encourage him. We thank you for helping Jerry in his recovery and ask that you continue to heal him. We pray for Jerry Kokenberg and his family. We ask for healing and peace and comfort. Father, we pray for Richard as he brings the message this morning. Please speak through him and make us attentive to what you have to say to us. Now we pray together as Jesus taught us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power in the glory forever. Amen. No. Richard? Check and make sure the power is on here. Yep. <clears throat> Would you pray with me, please? Father, as we gather here before you today in what truly is a sanctuary from the frantic world where most of us live our lives, where most of our lives actually take place, please quiet our hearts, enable us to truly be still right here this morning in your presence. May we discover afresh just how important it is that we regularly come away by ourselves to a desolate or a secluded place so we can get the rest that's absolutely essential to all of life and ministry. And Father, I want to remember this morning to pray for the nation of Israel, where people, in light of what's transpired in the last 24 hours, are finding it probably very hard to rest. I thank you, Father, for those men and women who know and love Jesus there, who know that they can rest in him. And I pray this all in the mighty name of Jesus. It was while preparing this morning's message that I recalled a passage from a novel I read quite a few years ago, and it really surprised me that I actually remembered it. Uh, it's a novel called Robert Falconer by the 19th century Scottish author, poet, and Christian minister, George MacDonald. A passage that speaks directly to the focus of this morning's study. George MacDonald's writings were, in fact, one of the things that C.S. Lewis himself described as influential in bringing him to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. 
While the vocabulary of the following passage is very Victorian, <clears throat> I believe the meaning will be quite clear. It reads as follows. The curate of St. Gregory seems ambitious of killing himself with work, of wearing himself out in the service of his master and as quickly as possible. A good deal of that kind of thing is a mere holding of the ax to the grindstone, not a lifting it up against thick trees. I met him the other day. He was looking as white as his surplice. I took upon me to read him a lecture on the holiness of holidays. I can't leave my poor, he said. Do you think God can't do without you, I asked? Is he so weak that he cannot spare the help of a weary man? But I must think he prefers quality to quantity. And for healthy work, you must be healthy yourself. How can you be the visible sign of Christ present in this world among men if you inhabit an exhausted, irritable brain? Go to God's infirmary and rest a while. Bring back health from the country to those who cannot go to it. And if on the way it be transmuted into spiritual forms, so much the better. A little more of God will make up for a good deal less of you. Now, I think there's some real wisdom in that, this parishioner's words to his weary pastor. A wisdom both gleaned from the pages of scripture and a wisdom clearly displayed in the life of Jesus himself. Interestingly, in the passage from Mark's gospel that Linda read for us this morning, Jesus' words to his disciples, come away by yourselves to a desolate or a secluded place and rest a while, are more than just good advice. In the original, they're actually a command. It's actually a command. And Jesus himself perfectly modeled for us not only what it means to truly rest, how critically important rest is both physically and spiritually, but also how God has clearly revealed the pattern for which that defines the necessary balance, the balance between work and rest. Not only is rest essential for the welfare of our bodies and the well-being of our souls, it actually is, it really is a matter of obedience. God made that perfectly clear in Exodus 29 to 11, where we read, six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. The, the Hebrew word Shabbat, transliterated into English as Sabbath, literally means, it literally means rest. And because God blessed Shabbat and declared it holy for the Israelites under the law of Moses, the penalty for willfully profaning the Sabbath, the penalty for, for just willfully proclaiming the Sabbath was, you remember, it was death. Exodus 31, 14. Now before going on, uh, there's one issue I want to make sure we're very clear on. God didn't create the entire universe in six days as recorded in Genesis 1 because it was such a huge undertaking that he actually needed six days. He could have created it all with a single spoken word. And he certainly didn't rest on day seven because he'd grown so weary he required the rest. God purposely chose, purposely chose to create the universe and everything in it in six literal 24-hour days, resting on the seventh as a pattern, as a pattern for how man who he created in his own image was to live. The very creative activity of God himself recorded in the very first chapter of our scriptures, teaches us the value and the importance both of work and rest, as well as the importance of maintaining a proper balance between the two, a balance that mankind has struggled to keep 
struggled to maintain ever since the fall. Our purpose this morning is to unpack this issue of rest as Jesus himself addresses it here in Mark 6. Because there's no question that Jesus understood better than any man who's ever lived the essential nature and importance of rest. In doing this, I believe there's much that we can actually learn by reviewing the host of circumstances that actually led up to Jesus' instructions to his disciples that was read for us this morning. Come away by yourselves to a secluded place and rest a while. Your life is very busy and distress and stressful. Um, we all need that rest. In Mark 6, 30, we discover that the disciples had just returned from their first major ministry assignment. Earlier in this same chapter, we see Jesus send the 12 out two by two to preach repentance and with the authority to heal the sick and cast out demons. When they returned from this extended time of ministry, they were eager, clearly eager to gather together with Jesus and report back to him all they had done and taught. But we read that this debriefing might possibly have been interrupted or maybe somewhat rushed because of the comings and goings of the multitudes seeking out Jesus. It had become so unrelenting they couldn't even find time to eat a meal. Clear back in Mark 3.10, we read of the large, persistent crowds who not only gathered around Jesus, but were often actually physically pressing in on him. Everywhere he went, <clears throat> many of these people were ill and demon-possessed. And Mark tells us that they actually converged in on Jesus, physically in on Jesus, attempting to touch him physically, in their desperation to be healed. Jesus, however, along with his disciples, was having to deal with much more than just the constant pressure from the crowds that often made it necessary for Jesus to literally disengage himself from the crowds by climbing into a boat just so he could teach. And it made it difficult even to eat a meal together on a regular basis. And I believe there's no question that Jesus was truly grieving over the execution of John the Baptist as recorded here in this same chapter, verses 14 to 29. John was not only the forerunner, the one who had prepared the way for Jesus' ministry, he was actually Jesus' cousin. And to even suggest that John's execution did not have a huge emotional impact on Jesus is to deny his very humanity. Throughout the first five chapters of Mark's gospel, we repeatedly see those large, persistent crowds converge on Jesus from all over Judea, Galilee, and beyond. But in the opening verses of chapter 6, we discover that he was flat-out rejected when he visited Nazareth, the very town he grew up in. The residents of Jesus' hometown actually took offense at him they took offense at him, and for the very same reasons, the multitudes from everywhere else were attracted to him. The residents of Nazareth were astonished, literally awestruck at his teaching. They were shocked by his wisdom, and they were simply unable to deal with the fact that this former tradesman, this carpenter, whose entire family was so well known to them, was now performing mighty miracles. And the intensity of the unbelief that he encountered in Nazareth actually caused him to wonder, to wonder. Jesus literally marveled at the shocking level of unbelief that he encountered among the very people he'd grown up around. And all of this, all of this stuff was compounded by the mounting opposition of the Jewish leaders who incessantly hounded Jesus virtually everywhere he went. <laughs> they were so beside themselves because he regularly healed people on the Sabbath that they actually accused him in Mark 3.22 of being in league with Satan. And their rejection of Jesus had grown so vehement they began conspiring with the Herodians in Mark 3.6 
how they might kill him. And in Mark 3.21, we read that even his own family and friends thought he had literally lost his mind. And this unrelenting pressure that Jesus and his disciples were experiencing from so many different directions finally reached the point where Jesus very wisely called for a timeout. In Mark 6.31, he said to them, come away by yourselves to a secluded place and rest a while. Now, there are a number of principles I believe we can glean from this gospel record that are so important, so very important, if we're to learn how God intends for us to deal effectively with the frustrating, often exhausting pressures that inevitably create stress in our lives. And what we commonly refer to as stress is actually the way God designed our bodies. It's the way our bodies and our spirits respond to the everyday challenges and the inevitable pressures of life and to any perception of the threats we might feel to our safety and well-being. I don't think Adam and Eve stressed, but after the fall, we all stress. Life, by definition, is stressful. And the first thing we all need to understand is this. All of that pressure and all of the stress that we experience in life is cumulative. It constantly accumulates in our lives. And the only way, the only way to effectively deal with that stress and its consequences is to interrupt it, is to rest. And when we talk about stress, we need to understand that it comes in more than just one form. I mean, of course, there's the stress we might refer to as bad stress, the kind of stress that we see Jesus and his disciples dealing with just the pressures of life and ministry. But there's also a good kind of stress. It's clinically referred to as eustress, E-U stress. The sort of stress that manifests itself as excitement, as euphoria, as eager anticipation, as the thrill of victory, and so on. But unfortunately, even these good types of stress have the same effect on our bodies that bad stress does. They raise our blood pressure. They interfere with our sleep patterns. And they can literally exhaust us both physically and emotionally. Like the three-year-old, so excited that his dad was taking him fishing for the very first time. They can't sleep the night before and is so tired when they get home, dad has to carry him sound asleep back into the house. That's my personal story, by the way. You <clears throat> stress is still stress. And all stress is cumulative. And the only way to deal effectively with accumulating stress is to interrupt it by resting. And remember, if Jesus experienced the need for rest, and he did, the very Son of God, the very Son of God who took on human flesh, how much more do you think you and I need it? Remember, Scripture cautions us cautions us not to lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. Galatians 6, 9. And Paul wrote in 2 Thessalonians 3, 13, as for you, brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. These verses make it very clear that without proper rest, we can and we will grow weary and inevitably struggle to do all the good that God is calling us to do. In Leviticus 25, 2 and 6, God actually reinforced this concept of rest by commanding the Israelites to observe a Sabbath of rest for the very land they lived on and from which they grew their, drew their sustenance. Because creation itself has been cursed and subjected to futility as a result of man's fall and his sin, God commanded they were to work their land and gather in its produce for six years. Then in the seventh year, their land, their land was to have a Sabbath rest unto the Lord with this promise that they would have plenty of food to eat while the land rested. But what exactly does it mean to rest? What does true rest actually look like or involve? 
And for that, we, we need to go back to the very words of Scripture to ensure that when we rest, we do so in accord with God's design and not according to some self-defeating plan of our own. We need to start by understanding that the word for rest that Jesus used right here in Mark 6.31 literally carries the meaning to cease from labor to recover one's strength. Cease from labor to recover one's strength. We're to, we're to interrupt, we're to take an actual break from all those activities that by their very nature cause us to grow weary from the accumulating stress in our lives. So in light of the importance that God himself places upon rest, let's look at what the scriptures reveal about true biblical rest. Number one, it's so important that we learn to cultivate the discipline of rest. Don't we hate that word, discipline? It's so important that we learn the discipline of rest. That means to, we're to be very intentional, very disciplined, if you will, in actually planning for rest. We actually need to schedule those times of rest, and we need to be very disciplined in keeping to that schedule. God made that perfectly clear when he commanded Israel to work for six days and keep the seventh day as a Sabbath of rest to the Lord. God made that day holy and set apart, and he declared severe consequences for all who refused to keep it holy. God knew that the everyday pressures of life, the accumulating responsibilities that we all are dealing with, and the sometimes excessive demands that others place upon us in our time, can make it very difficult for undisciplined people to sanctify or set apart rest and keep it holy. In the frantic world so many of us live in today, rest that is not scheduled seldom happens. Two, it's significant that when Jesus commanded his disciples to rest a while, he instructed them to come away by yourselves to a desolate or a secluded or a lonely place. Jesus was telling them that they needed to be very intentional in seeking out a place where they could put some distance between them and the things that were creating stress in their lives. Stress that inevitably leads to weariness and undermines our ability to do good in the service of our Lord. In the, in the immediate context here in Mark 6, it was the unrelenting pressure from the crowds that Mark described as constantly coming and going. But we now live in a world where not just people, but a whole host of digital devices are constantly demanding our attention. And given the chronic, chronically overcommitted schedule so many of us keep, even finding a secluded place can be incredibly difficult. But with God's help, we can make it happen. I don't know if you've heard of Susanna Wesley, the mother of John and Charles Wesley, whom I'm sure you probably have heard of. But back in the early 1700s, Susanna Wesley was the godly mother of her two well-known sons, John and Charles. <laughs> the truth is, Charles, you'll, this, ooh, Charles was literally, he was actually her 18th child. I see people shaking their heads. <laughs> he, Charles was actually her 18th child and in a house literally swarming with children. How was a mother to find a secluded place where she could be still and keep quiet company with her Lord? Well, here's how she did it. In the Wesley home, it was understood that when Mother Susanna sat down in a chair and pulled her apron up over her head, pulled her apron up over her head, this was her time to be alone with her Lord. Susanna would spend up to two hours a day seated on a chair under her apron, fellowshipping with her Lord and praying for her family. And amazingly, her children respected this as her time to be still and to know her God. And just like Susanna, 
we need to understand that when Jesus said, come away by yourselves to a secluded place, he was emphasizing the need for solitude. In their case, given the persistent crowds, their only option was to seek out a desolate place, somewhere away from the crowds, but more often than not, intentionally taking the time to rest and finding a true place of solitude has more to do with our priorities and our self-discipline than it has to do with any particular place. For many of us experiencing those times of true solitude that will allow us to truly rest needs to start with turn off the television. Silence all the digital distractions that we surround ourselves with. Take a break from social media and literally spend some time alone. Even individual members of busy families need to set apart a time and a place where they can rest all by themselves so they can keep quiet company alone with their Lord just as Jesus did frequently when he would withdraw to be alone with his father. Number three, now this rest we're talking about is not what so many folks often refer to as simply vegging out. The rest Jesus commanded and regularly observed himself was never simply doing nothing. Yes, we all need to physically take a break from our labors. Jesus himself sometimes got so physically tired he was able to sleep on a cushion in an open fishing boat in the middle of a violent storm. But whether he was physically weary or not, the Gospels record how he would regularly slip away into a secluded place all by himself, not to veg out, but so he could pray, meditate, and commune with his Father. Jesus' example clearly illustrates not only the importance of physically resting, from our labors, but the importance of resting ourselves spiritually and emotionally as well. However, I'm sure most of us here today have discovered that even when we're able to physically rest our bodies, it can often be difficult to rest spiritually and emotionally because our minds are unable to filter out all that stuff that's creating the stress in the first place. And there's no question that when we're unable to rest our minds, the physical rest we may get will never undo the weariness that always affects both our bodies and our minds. Number four, all of this highlights the necessity of cultivating a reliable strategy for calming down and stilling our mind so we can rest. Psalm 46:10 one I'm sure is familiar to all of you, it says, be still, literally cease striving, let go, relax, but be still and know that I am God. And how do you let go of all those things that are often swirling around in your mind so you can rest, so you can truly be still in body, mind, and spirit? Once you're actually come away to your own private place of solitude? Are you truly able to be still once you're there? As an active birder, bird watcher, yeah, I'm one of those geeky guys. As an active birder for over 50 years, one of my favorite ways to still my thoughts and let go of all that stuff that's cluttering my mind is to simply sit in our backyard swing and watch the birds. Personally, I find time spent in nature to be especially calming. And certain kinds of music, certain kinds of music always, I mean always, enable me to clear my mind and be still. There's a line from an old poem. I'm sure most of you have heard it. Music hath charms to soothe the savage beast. And just recall how when King Saul was troubled by evil spirits, David would come and play his harp. And 1 Samuel 16, 23 tells us that Saul would be refreshed and be well, and the evil spirit would depart from him. 
For others, it may simply be going for a quiet walk all by themselves, or a truly relaxing hobby or activity that doesn't involve competition, other people, or needless excitement. But the thing we all need to understand, to truly rest, we must learn to be still, to be still in body, mind, and spirit. Number five, I find it fascinating that the Greek word translated worry in the New American Standard Bible is usually, and actually more literally, translated as take thought. Take thought in the King James. Like, take not, don't take thought for what you will wear today, you know, in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. It's a, a clear indication that what we call worry has to do with our thinking. And worry is really obsessive, undisciplined thinking. Worry results when we fail to be still, to cease all that striving in our minds, or to simply let go of our anxious thoughts so we can literally slow down, relax, and know that he is God. And ultimately, that's the whole point of rest. We need rest. We need to rest physically, emotionally, and spiritually by creating those secluded places in our lives so we can keep quiet company with our Lord and get to know him more personally and more intimately. And just as Jesus would frequently slip away to a secluded place all by himself to pray and to commune with the Father, we too need to set apart and keep holy those same times of quiet rest. We simply cannot function as God has designed us to function if we fail to rest as God has commanded it. It really is that simple. There are two more quick points I want to make in closing. First of all, God commanded we're to get all our work done in six days and rest on day seven because it's essential for our physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being. But I would likewise suggest that setting apart a quiet, secluded place in each and every day so we, just like Susanna Wesley, can keep quiet company with our Lord, feast on his word, meditate, and commune with him in prayer. I believe this is an absolute essential discipline in the life of every believer. It's how we keep our spiritual batteries charged. It's how we find the strength, the wisdom, and the courage to take on life's challenges and not grow weary in doing good. And secondly, we need to look at Mark 6, 32 to 34, which Linda read this morning for us. Following Jesus' ver command in verse 31, we read that they did. They went away in a boat to a secluded place by themselves. But many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he, referring to Jesus, went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. Now ponder this. Jesus had just made the point that they were very much in need of a break and they were to come away by themselves to a secluded place so that they could get the rest they so sorely needed. But then... And arriving at that secluded place, they discover it's anything but secluded. The very crowds they were intentionally withdrawing from had seen them leave, had figured out where they were headed, and literally running there on foot, they got there ahead of them. Since this whole thing was Jesus' idea in the first place, you'd think he would have said, whoa, guys, back in the boat. After going ashore and discovering the multitudes had outmaneuvered them. But instead, we see Jesus, that he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And later, as, as the hour grew late and the disciples, probably very frustrated by this point, were pressuring Jesus to send the crowd away because they all need to find some place to buy dinner. He said to them, no, you give them something to eat. 
And their response was basically, what? You, you've got to be kidding. Why, buying enough bread to feed this crowd will wipe out our petty cash fund. Now, I'm sure you're familiar with the rest of the story. How Jesus took a young boy's sack lunch, blessed it, and miraculously fed over 5,000 hungry souls. But the critically important principle of ministry that Jesus was teaching both his disciples and us is this. As important as it is, and it's very important, as important as it is to intentionally plan for regular times of rest, we are never to intentionally plan not to minister. Did you make sense? We've all encountered situations where opportunities to minister to those in need arose when we felt like, no, not now. I really, really need to take a break. But the Holy Spirit keeps telling us, no, you really do need to minister to this need right now. It's what Jesus would do. And here's the beautiful truth in all of this. If we are faithfully keeping those necessary times of rest as set apart and holy to our God, we will be able to minister effectively in Jesus' name, even at the most inopportune of times. So I ask each of us this morning, are we in fact truly cultivating the biblical discipline of rest? God commanded it. Each of us desperately needs it. And without it, we will inevitably grow weary in doing good. It's so important that we actually plan, actually plan to regularly withdraw to a quiet place of true solitude so we can rest because our entire culture is literally conspiring to rob us of those opportunities. And if you are regularly withdrawing to a place of true solitude, are you actually using your time there to cultivate a stillness before your God that will allow you to know him more personally and more intimately? May each of us be able to say today, as the psalmist David said in Psalm 73, whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you, I desire nothing on earth. As for me, the nearness of my God is my good. Will you pray with me? Father, we really do believe that drawing near to you is our ultimate and highest good. It's how we truly come to 